Hi, this is Dr. Churchill for Astronomy 308 into the Final Frontier. And we are now in the midst of the space race. And at this time, we are going to really kind of focus down on the, um, the NASA missions that were done in the 1960s. So as you know, we've had Sputnik that stirred the, uh, the United States to uh, then have Eisenhower uh, create NASA. And then NASA's main goal was man in space soonest, M-I-S-S. And for that, they developed something called Project Mercury. So today we're gonna to spend some time talking about Project Mercury. And um, then the follow-on project uh, after that was called Project Gemini. We'll spend some time talking about that to eventually get ourselves up to the moon landings and the Apollo program. Um, during this period of time, we're going to talk about with the Mercury and Gemini. In parallel, the Soviet unions were working very hard at trying to get a human in space and, and uh, have space missions that were more profound and further advanced than those in the United States. So I want you to remember that that's going on in parallel. And then when we come back after Mercury and Gemini, we will spend a little time talking about what the Soviets were doing during the same period. Okay, so let me share my, share my slides. Okay, so welcome to the first manned uh, set of missions it, uh, for NASA, and this is called Project Mercury. Um, when NASA was formed, the first thing they did was put out a call to recruit some astronauts um, I think they wanted something like six or seven, and they, they ended up getting seven. And they literally invited uh, tens of thousands of people that were fighter pilots, uh, you know, all kinds of walks of life, engineers, people that were technical. And uh, in the end, they decided that the fighter pilots really fit the bill the best because they were used to doing test flight. They were used to doing test flight and pushing new spacecraft, I should say, new aircraft to the limits, and then bringing them home and, and evaluate them, write the, write the reports and evaluate them. And so much of what was needed at this time was testing the craft itself. You know, you're, you're engineering things that had never been built before. And so you need to test those craft, the spacecraft. And then, you know, you have to have somebody in that spacecraft that can evaluate it objectively and is used to pulling themselves out of sticky situations, which could be life-threatening to say the least. In the end, they decided uh, on these seven people. And uh, here's a nice photograph of them here. I'll, I'll show you them in detail in a minute. And I love this little picture on the side, which you know, for each one of them that had a mission, they, uh, they signed it. And uh, each mission had, an, had a name. Um, and we're gonna go through these missions today. So here are the Mercury 7 astronauts. Um, they were selected in 1959, and I believe there was a pool of about 12,000 um, applicants. Now, that's not to say that I think NASA invited something like 20,000 people to uh, apply. I'm not sure of that exact number, but in the end, not everybody applied because some people thought of this as being a dead-end career path. Uh, why would you go do this kind of crazy thing where you just at the top of a rocket and get lofted up and come back down um, when you could be a test pilot flying the best jets, the most cutting edge jets and, and really pushing these things in, in technical ways. I think what people didn't realize um, was that this was going to blossom into a, a whole new set, a whole new world of test flight. So um, the first individual we have in the upper left here is Alan B. Shepard. He was a naval test pilot. Uh, and then we have Virgil Grissom, also known as Gus Grissom. And then a very famous astronaut that I think is almost a household name for everybody, and that's John Glenn. Excuse me, he was the oldest of the astronauts when he was selected. We have Deke Slayton over here in the lower left, followed by Scott Carpenter, Wally Shira, and Gordon Cooper. And these 
seven gentlemen really went through the ringer to get this position and were tested psychologically, physically in ways that uh, quite frankly, even in their view were ex was extreme. Now, what I'd like to do is take a quick aside to talk about the fact that yes, they selected men. And in the 60s, of course, um, the inequality between men and women was much more dramatic than it is even today. But it turned out that there were test fighter pilots that were women. There weren't as many, but there were this uh, elite group of women that had somehow raised through the ranks in a man's world to the point where they were actually engaged in, in test pilot flight. And so um, 13 of these women grouped together and decided that they wanted to actually be involved in the Mercury project. They were never actually recruited by NASA. They were never actually um, considered part of the NASA program, but they tried very hard and campaigned very hard. And these 13 women went through medical tests and went through the training. They followed all of the same steps that the Mercury 7 did. You know, they, they mimicked everything that they did. Um, in the end, NASA chose to ignore them. And because of this, the, their, their Mercury 13 project uh, dried up. And uh, even today, some of these women are well known by NASA and, and are well respected and partake in a lot of you know, NASA activities. But unfortunately, none of these women ever were, were selected as astronauts. That really didn't happen until the 1980s. So let's talk about Project Mercury in terms of its goals. As you imagine that if, if a, a bureaucracy as large as NASA is going to put together a program, they're gonna sit down and they're going to consider what, what are the objectives that we have here? And um, so in 1958, which is, as you know, in October of 1958 when NASA was born, but before NASA was born, out at Langley Research Center, which at the time was with the NACA instead of NASA, NASA, uh, was a group of people led by a gentleman by the name of Bob Gilruth. And they were called the Space Task Force. And they were already well advanced in their thinking about how to put humans in space. And they were already designing space capsules. They have, were designing what the goals would be and everything like that. And so it turned out that when NASA was formed, this group just immediately got adopted. They got immediately recruited into the MISS program, which, as I said, morphed into Project, Project Mercury. And so these gentlemen uh, were the lead in defining Project Mercury. And this is what they came up with. Um, they said, our number one goal is to orbit a manned spacecraft around the Earth. Number two is to investigate man's ability to function in space. And number three is to recover both the man and the spacecraft safely. So these were very, very rudimentary goals in a situation where people were probing a new ocean, okay? Um, it turned out that Project Mercury had six flights. They lasted from 1961 to 1963. The, the, the project itself, as I say, was initiated in 1958, but it took them until 1961 to actually fly one of their astronauts. And then in 1963, roughly a year and a half to two years later, they completed the program. And you might be thinking, I've done the math. They had six flights and there were seven astronauts. So yes, one of the Mercury 7 did not fly. And I'll tell you that story in a minute. Um, so I'm showing you here a... Uh, picture uh, on the lower left, uh, this CC Bibby was uh, responsible for painting the spacecraft. And I just thought that it was really kind of fun to show you that, that so many people were involved in this in so many levels. And uh, I can imagine the pride of painting every spacecraft before it flew must, must have been uh, amazing for her. Sigma 7 is the capsule she's painting here. And that was the last of the, of the uh, Mercury spacecraft flights. Um, the reason there was a seven is because they, they always put a seven on each one of their spacecraft to indicate that they were treating each other as equals. There's seven of them, 
all of them are flying. There may be one astronaut in the cockpit of the spacecraft, but all seven were flying. You know, they, this was a, a situation where they, they worked together to, to um, build these missions and fly the missions, but they competed against each other to see who could go first. Of course, that was the feather in the cap. So it was a very intense environment for these seven astronauts. This is um, a small schematic of the Mercury space capsule, and you can see it is very, very small and very, very compact. In fact, the couch is form fitting to each person's body. They actually uh, formed it to each astronaut perfectly. Um, and then uh, you can see here um, at the bottom side of the spacecraft is something called the heat shield. And one of the biggest problems of spaceflight is not necessarily getting the rocket up into space, but it's bringing back down what you put into space safely. And the hardest part of that is something called the heat of reentry. When you come crashing back down to the atmosphere, and I don't want it to sound like it's crashing, but when you're speeding and the atmosphere starts to get thicker, you get a lot of heat friction. And there was a lot of engineering discussion on how you do this. And an engineer named Max Faget um, realized that if you make the back end of the spacecraft very blunt, that that would dissipate the heat. And then if you make the heat shield, a shield that does something called ablation. It heats up, it, its outer layer melts, and that outer layer then gets blown off from the, the, the friction and the heat, and it carries the heat away from, and, and evaporates past the spacecraft in the atmosphere, but the idea is that it carries, it carries the heat away from the spacecraft. And so this is called a heat shield with something called ablation, heat ablation. Now, the other thing that you have on the spacecraft uh, are these straps and something called the retro rockets. So when the spacecraft was orbiting, uh, the retro rockets were, were strapped to the back on the bottom of the heat shield. And the retro rockets were basically to, as they say, to fire backwards. So if the, sp the spacecraft wanted to come back into the atmosphere, they had to slow it down. So they would uh, move the spacecraft so it was moving backwards relative to its direction of motion. And then they would fire the retro rockets to slow the spacecraft down. And then they would uh, use solenoid bolts with little explosives on them to uh, blast the straps off and, and jettison the retro pack. And it would just burn up in the atmosphere as it re-entered. And then the, space, uh, the heat shield would be exposed for the spacecraft so that it could then re-enter and have the ablation work to keep it cool. This is a picture of Alan Shepard dressed in a typical Mercury 7 spacesuit. And you can see then the size of, of the human compared to the Mercury spacecraft. And over here is the Russian spacecraft. Um, the spacecraft itself where the astronaut was is just this round globe. And then this is actually uh, what we call a service module, which contains a lot of, of the electronics and the fuel cells and batteries and things like that. Before the Mercury 7 flew, they flew uh, some monkeys. Enos and Ham were two of the most famous of those. And um, these two monkeys actually did these suborbital flights and they uh, were able to basically perform uh, number two, their goal number two, instead of investigating man's ability to function in space, they uh, investigated a chimpanzee's ability to function in space. And then for goal number three, recover both chimpanzee and spacecraft safely. So they did this without risking a human life. Um, I'm not saying that uh, they were, that being one of those chim chimps was the best thing on the planet, but certainly uh, you got to, uh, experience something pretty amazing for, uh, for a chimp. I don't know if they really completely understood the rocket ride they took. And then finally, um, here's a, a picture of one of the Mercury 7, Jerry Cobb, who was probably what was, she was considered the leader and the, and the um, most promising of the Mercury 13 to actually perhaps get a chance to fly. Now, since one of the Mercury 7 didn't fly, it would have been really great if they had flown the 7 mission and brought in Jerry Cobb or somebody like that. 
Okay, these are the two rockets that uh, down here in the lower, lower right corner that flew the Mercury space capsule. So you can see here it is on something called the Redstone rocket, and then here it is on something called the um, Atlas rocket. And the both of these were uh, ICBMs, so they they were technically built for delivering uh, bombs, especially the Atlas, which was from the Navy, and the Redstone was from the Army. Okay, so the first two flights, um, by the way. Uh, the first human in space was not an American through Mercury. It was actually Yuri Gagarin who flew uh, for the Soviet Union. And it happened only basically about a month before uh, Alan Shepard's flight. He was the first American in space. So the first two flights were flights that we call suborbital flights. They were not orbital flights. And I'll, I'll show you in the next slide uh, some somewhat of the difference between the suborbital flight and the orbital flight. But this was a 15 minute flight for Alan Shepard. And he basically went up and did a, a parabolic arc and then came back down. And that whole process took about 15 minutes. So they basically put him up into space and then let him come right back down. Excuse me. He called his spacecraft Freedom 7. It was, you know, kind of the Cold War thing. You know, they're the Soviets, they're not free, they're oppressive civilization, and we are the Americans, we are free, and here's our Freedom 7 spacecraft. So it was a real statement uh, for that kind of thing going on with the space race and the, the Cold War. So here's Alan inside the spacecraft before flight. He's looking a little tense and Here's the liftoff, and then basically he would be picked up uh, by a helicopter and, and brought up, and then they would capture the spacecraft, bring it up, and then here he is coming back uh, at the successful mission. This was a tremendous shot in the arm for the United States. It cannot be overstated. After Sputnik uh, and after Yuri Gagarin, the United States was just hurting for some kind of space you know, a success. And so this was a tremendous success. A fun story about this is that they were so nervous about launching Shepard that he literally sat in that spacecraft for, for like six hours before he flew. I don't know the exact number, but it was many hours. And there's kind of a fun story about, you know, somewhere in that process, he really needed to go to the bathroom and he wanted to get out. And by then they had isolated him and brought all of the support staff from the pad away. They were all in what's called the blockhouse. And he was denied uh, permission to exit the spacecraft to relieve himself. And so he said, well, th and they didn't want him to relieve himself just you know, in a suit because he could get shocked. So they turned down all of the power off of the suit. He went to the bathroom in his suit. And then when it dried out, they turned the power back on, and uh, so he flew, and he's the uh, first astronaut to go pee pee in his spacesuit. Uh, next flight was uh, Gus Grissom, and uh, Virgil Grissom, um, as a Virgil I. Grissom, but really known as Gus, uh, he named his spacecraft the Liberty Bell 7, and, and he flew, uh, so in May, and then April, and then June, and then July. So you can see they spent a lot of time debriefing from Alan Shepard's flight and understanding as many details as they could before they uh, went ahead and flew again. So they were in no hurry to push numbers. They were in a hurry to do it right, if you will. Um, so he, was, uh, he also flew a suborbital orbital flight uh, for 15 minutes. And in his case, it turns out that um, after he splashed down, for some reason, the hatch jettisoned. It had explosive bolts to make it jettison. And when that happened, while he was still in the water, the water started coming in the spacecraft. So he jumped out of the spacecraft. Now he had taken off his helmet and water was coming in through the collar. And so he started to get water built up in his spacesuit and he was beginning to drown. And his spacecraft was filling with water. It was going under. Well, they basically saved Gus Grissom, but the spacecraft went underwater. Now, the thing is that 
a lot of people said that he panicked and that he had pounded this button on his arm rest that uh, would jettison the, the hatch. And he insists that he didn't. Um, they all know from um, simulations, basically, that's the word they use for practice. But for simulations of the mission, uh, it turns out that when the astronaut had to hit that thing, they would, they would get a bruise and Gus didn't have the bruise. So the astronauts really believed him, but a lot of management didn't believe him. And it, years went by, and I can't remember what year they did, but they finally, you can see in the picture on the right here, they finally decided to bring that space capsule up. And after decades of that debate, it turned out, drum roll please, Gus Grissom did not blow the hatch. It, it accidentally blew, it was a malfunction. Okay, so this is the difference between orbital flight and suborbital flight. Um, here I've got the image of uh, the Earth and sort of the, the ocean of space around it, if you will. And so they would launch from Cape Canaveral, as it was called at the time, and they would lift off, go pretty much straight up and then come back down and then come down on the parachute and land, get picked up. And this whole uh, process took about 15 minutes. And this little uh, diagram down here shows you sort of minute by minute what the uh, astronaut was experiencing or what he was supposed to engage in. So for example, um, periscope visual obs observation. This is you know when the, when the point in the flight where the, the astronaut could uh, open up a periscope and, and look around at the earth and things like that. Um, first manual control came around 310 to help test the spacecraft. They basically just wanted to test, can you rotate the spacecraft? And you know how does it respond to the amount of fuel and the, that you uh, thrust with? And so then you had the retrofire, um, you jettison the, the, the pack, as I talked about, and then you come through here. And uh, you, lose, um, you lose radio signal when you come through the atmosphere because you get this plasma that comes around the back of the spacecraft. And they call that LOS for loss of signal, LOS. And then you come through uh, reentry, you deploy what's called a drogue chute, which is a small parachute, which drags out the real main chute. Then the main chute opens, and then you splash down. And just for fun, my uncle was uh, an engineer who worked for NASA in, in this time, and he built the little solenoids, which exploded to pop off and let the drogue shoot out. And he said every time a Mercury 7 astronaut flew, you know, uh, he said it just chew his fingernails until that drogue shoot went out. And then he would know that his part had worked and he hadn't killed an astronaut. Um, so, okay, the suborbital flights flew on the Army's Redstone rocket. Okay, this was built by Werner von Braun. And um, it did not have enough power to lift um, this amount of weight. Um, for the spacecraft, um, for a Mercury capsule. And um, it wasn't until the Navy was able to make their Atlas lift booster, if you will, um, what they call man rated. Okay, the Atlas booster turned out had a very thin balloon shell. In fact, it was the, um, the fuel, the liquid fuel in it was actually part of what supported the rocket shell. Um, itself, and they had to fix that and make it stronger without making it heavier so that it could actually use its power to lift this um, Mercury spacecraft all the way into orbit. And of course, you can see that that takes a lot more energy because you have to get the spacecraft up to about 17,500 miles per hour in order to achieve orbit. Okay. Uh, the next flight was called Friendship 7, and that was from John Glenn. And this was the first flight on the um, Navy's Atlas booster, and therefore it was the first orbital flight by Americans. So sometimes people think of John Glenn, they think of him as the first man in space, which is not technically correct, but he is the first American to have orbited the Earth. Okay, and this happened in February, so you can see it was another six months from Gus Grissom's flight, which of course, with the technical difficulties of his ship sinking, his spacecraft sinking, they were not able to study 
the effects of the flight on the spacecraft directly, which was a huge loss for their understanding of the, the development of the program. His flight lasted four hours and 55 minutes, almost five hours. He did three orbits of the planet, okay? When he originally got into orbit, he was told that he would go for seven orbits, but then he had a technical glitch. And um, I'm having you watch that space flight movie, they'll talk about it. But one of the glitch he had was that there was an indicator light on it in his spacecraft that said that the um, airbag had deployed between the um, re-entry heat shield and the back of the spacecraft. Now, what is the airbag that I'm talking about? As you saw on the bottom of the spacecraft was the heat shield. And it was mated up against the bottom of the, of the Mercury capsule. But as it came down for splashdown, it was designed that it would, uh, that an airbag would open up and fill with air and then cause a, like, a cushion between the heat shield when it hit the ocean and the back of the spacecraft so that the astronaut didn't feel as much shock. So he had a, an indicator light saying that that airbag had deployed. Now, this is um, going to, he's basically a dead astronaut if this was true, because this would mean that his heat shield had detached from the back of the spacecraft. And the only thing holding the shield, heat shield at this point in time, you know, he's still in orbit, was that retro pack with those straps that held it on. And so the way they solved this was they brought him home early, and that's why only three orbits instead of the seven. And when he came through reentry, they told him, do not jettison the retro pack. Don't break those straps and let it fall off. Keep the straps because hopefully that will help hold the heat shield to the back of the spacecraft while you're going through the reentry. So he wasn't sure that he wasn't going to die as the spacecraft was going through reentry, but it turned out it was a false indication. And we have now the famous John Glenn, who eventually later flew on the space shuttle in the 1990s. Now, John Glenn's orbit meant that we were now in the business of space flight. When the Russians sent Yuri Gagarin to space in April of 1961, a month before Alan Shepard did his little suborbital loft, okay, Yuri Gagarin had orbited the Earth. So they beat us by an entire, almost an entire year on orbiting a human. And that was the bar that we had to hurdle. We needed to get somebody in orbit. And so John Glenn's mission hurdled that bar, put the United States on par with the Soviet Union to some degree. They're still behind, it's, that story's coming. But as you can see from this image here on the right, he had ticker tapes in New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and people, the, the whole nation, was just elated on, on a huge high uh, for this project and for John Glenn. He became extremely famous and in fact, decided to get into politics after that and became a Senator of Ohio and spent the rest of his career as a successful Senator. Okay, Deke Slayton was supposed to fly next and it turned out that he was grounded and he was grounded because he had a small heart murmur this, of course, was absolutely devastating to him. And so he did not get to fly in Project Mercury. And eventually what we're gonna find out is that he took the position as the, the, the boss of the astronauts, what they call the astronaut boss. And he ended up later deciding who flew on the missions. He assigned the crews and he became in charge of the entire astronaut office, which as we're gonna see is going to grow rapidly from seven up to you know, another 25 astronauts before the Apollo program starts. So next up in line, it was given to Scott Carpenter. And uh, here we have a picture of Scott Carpenter getting ready in a spacesuit. Here he is during a simulation flight. And he called his spacecraft the Aurora 7. And um, so his flight also lasted about the same um, length as John Glenn's. And uh, his, he was basically, his flight, you know, like Gus Grissom was duplicate Alan Shepard and, you know, 
Scott Carpenter was basically duplicate John Glenn. Now, the thing about Scott Carpenter's flight was that he is not really an engineer type of person. He's more of a science type of person uh, in spirit. They might say that he marched to a different drummer. And when he got up there, he was turning the spacecraft, you know, he's, here he is in orbit and he used up all of his maneuvering fuel and he literally uh, could not orientate his spacecraft properly so that the, the butt end was forward for reentry. And he somehow waited till it got lined up right by, you know, and he hit that button at the right time. And um, let's just say that Scott Carpenter was very lucky to come back alive. Not only that, but because of these problems, he shot 300 miles past his landing spot. So it was hours. You have to understand this isn't the modern day where you know we have global communication instantaneously. You know he's in, out in the ocean, and there are there is no communication. There's no GPS pointing us where to go. They had to be searched by you know dead reckoning. And so finally, after three and a half to four hours, uh, the the ship pulled up and found him. And the word is is that he was just casually waiting as if nothing was gone wrong. And, you know, even today, you, you uh, hear interviews with, with Scott Carpenter, and he's basically, yeah, I had a great mission. I have no idea why everybody had such a problem with it. But he's, the engineers are saying he's lucky he came back alive. Next up is Sigma-7. This is Wally Shira. Now, you might get to know Wally Shira a little bit later because he gets to fly in Gemini, and then he gets to fly in Apollo. And he flew very key missions. Wally Shara was what we might call an astronaut's astronaut. He was a precision flyer and a precision test pilot. He was about the engineering and he called science crap. Now, that bothers me because I love science and I don't consider science crap. But I think he just meant he doesn't want to do science, science experiments in space. He doesn't want to, you know, How's my blood pressure? He wants to know how the spacecraft is, is acting. So he did a six orbit flight. They upped it by a factor of two. He was in space for almost 10 hours. This was on October 3rd of 1962. Now, you may remember from our previous lectures that in October of 1962, that was when the Cuban Missile Crisis was at its peak. So the whole world was on edge for what was really the closest brink to World War III and possibly nuclear global war. And um, Wally Schra flew in the middle of that and literally the world did not pay any attention. So in the case of Wally Schra, he flew this beautiful textbook perfect mission and it just went into the books and nobody really took notice because the planet was on the verge of World War III. Finally, we get to Gordon Cooper and Faith Seven. Now this is an amazing story. Gordon Cooper was the last to fly. And he was really what, his nickname was the Oklahoma hot dog. And he was known for kind of breaking the rules. And one of the things he did about a month before his flight was he flew down low, uh, very close to the, the uh, a main building in the, in the um, uh, Johnson Space Center, or uh, I think it might actually have been out Cape Canaveral. And he had the afterburners on and he flew very low. He, he buzzed this NASA administration building. And <laughs> of course, these NASA administrators were like, this guy's nuts. We need to take him off the flight. And um, it turned out that, you know, Alan Shepard really went to bat for him and kept him on that flight because that would have been the end of his career. It turned out that was a great decision because Gordon Cooper did something spectacular. They decided with his flight, since it was the last, they were going to push it to the absolute limits. And you might notice that his flight actually lasted over two calendar days, May 15 and May 16. And it lasted almost 35 hours, so more than a day in space. This is a huge jump from, say, 10 hours in space from Sigma-7 and, and Wally Shira. And so this is a, what happened was that the spacecraft itself, the Mercury spacecraft was not designed to last that long. 
you know, one of the things you have on the spacecraft is something called a carbon dioxide scrubber. And this is a filter. And those filters only last so long before they get saturated with carbon dioxide. And they're basically there to take the carbon dioxide exhaled by the astronaut and filter it out of the air so that the, you know, the air stays uh, at, at a tolerable level of carbon dioxide concentration. As you all know, we cannot breathe carbon dioxide uh, without passing out and eventually dying. Um, so the, carbons, the carbon dioxide scrubber was one thing that was designed to go so long and it, it started to fail. Um, he had a radio um, that was working and then he lost the uh, automatic computers and um, the thermostats. He, he basically everything on that spacecraft failed except for what was could be done manually. And so he literally flew that spacecraft manually uh, by keeping time on his watch and pushing the retro rocket buttons by himself, by orientating the spacecraft by himself, by just using the markers on the windows and the horizon of the planet. And everything was human done. And he flew a picture perfect mission all the way to the end. And in fact, landed closer to the aircraft carrier in the ocean that was there to pick him up than any other astronaut uh, in their previous missions, of the Mercury missions. And so this was an amazing high note that uh, Project Mercury had ended on. And so I'd like to say that the spacecraft capsule payload was Gordon Cooper. Okay, next slide. Let us not forget Deke Slayton. Okay. So here's a picture of young Deke in the middle in the days when he was preparing for his Mercury missions. And he was pulled from the flight just like a week or two weeks before it flew. It would take until um, 1975 before Deke Slayton would fly into space. Okay. So what happened was um, he became the astronaut boss, which means, he, like I said, he picked the crews, even the crew for Apollo 11, the first landing on the moon. And he was engaged and he was there for all of it. If anybody was there and engaged in every single mission full up, uh, Deke Slayton had that privilege and that honor. When he did fly, it was for what was called the Apollo Soyuz Test Project. And this was three years after the last moon landing, and it was the last flight of an Apollo spacecraft. And they made a special docking ring so that the Apollo spacecraft could dock on one side, and the Soyuz uh, Russian or Soviet spacecraft could dock on the other side. And then here's a nice, beautiful picture of Deke Slayton with Alexei Leonov. And we're going to hear from Alexei Leonov later. Um, he was the first human to do a spacewalk. So he's very famous for that, to get out of a spacecraft while it was in orbit and in space. He also was the leading astronaut, our, in a sense, our counterpart um, of Neil Armstrong would be Alexei Leonov for the Soviet Union. He was considered to be the top candidate to be the first uh, Soviet to walk on the moon had they been successful with their moon project, which is a whole nother story that we're going to tell. So Deke got to make history after all, which is really great. Okay, so here's the Mercury spacecraft in short. And um, if you wanna see one in person, they have one at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, but right here in Alamogordo, uh, New Mexico, we have a space museum and they have a Mercury spacecraft shell that you can poke your head into. Uh, right there at the entry of the museum. Now, Alan Shepard is known to famously have said, you don't fly a Mercury space capsule, you wear it. And literally that's true. Like I said, the couch was form fitting, the, the spacesuit was form fitting and you fit right in there like a little pocket you were strapped in and you basically you know, were wearing this space capsule around you. Um, here's a picture of the um, cockpit itself and you can see that it's very, very tight very, very small. And here's the small window that you can see. Again, um, here's the heat shield. Here's that retro pack I was talking about for John Glenn. And here are the straps 
And so that, that airbag would have been between the spacecraft and the heat shield. And um, in order to try to keep it on, they had, a, had him keep these straps in this uh, retro pack strapped to the back in order, to, in case the heat shield was loose, then it would it would stay close to the spacecraft during reentry. Here's another example of exactly how tight the spacecraft is, and um, basically going through some of the major components of the spacecraft. And I guess one of the most interesting things about this are these little pitch jets, uh, which you know you could push some buttons, and um, a spacecraft had these three axes it would work on. One's called a pitch, which is basically up and down in your forward direction. The other one's called roll, which if you take the axis of the spacecraft, it's basically rolling left and rolling right. And then the other one is called yaw, which is basically turning left or turning right. Okay. And so these little yaw jets right here would be used to yaw the spacecraft, and the pitch jets here would be used to pitch it down or pitch it up. Okay, and then of course they had some rotation control jets as well. You can see where the drogue parachute was. Okay, and then uh, up here, this orange thing is uh, the antenna. And then you had some scanners that would uh, allow it to know whether you were seeing the horizons or not like that. So a lot of interesting things. Here's the hatch that blew that I was talking about for um, Gus Grissom and his Mercury flight. Now here's an example of some um, Gemini and Mercury space capsules and also the Apollo space capsules. So uh, looking at the rockets and the space capsules, this is the Mercury on the Atlas. And this is the Gemini, which was on something called the Titan II, which again was designed only for delivering nuclear bombs. And it turned out that was easy to man rate with such a solid booster. And then this is the Bohemoth, the Saturn V rocket itself. And up here is the command module, 360 feet high here. And then inside of uh, packed away here is the lunar landing module. When the command module and the lunar landing module were mated face to face and docked, they looked something like this. This spacecraft uh, right here is where the humans existed in the capsule, uh, fit three people. And uh, this whole area back here, we'll talk about more of this later, is called the service module. And then this is the, the key engine, the SPS engine. The um, lunar landing module, this is the area where two astronauts would work and um, move in and out of the spacecraft. And then this is the landing platform, or what's called the ascent or descent stage. And this is the descent engine. The Mercury spacecraft was this area uh, here. And this whole nose cone area is basically a lot of uh, parachutes and sensitive instruments and whatnot and navigation. And then this area, this whole white area was basically for storage of uh, certain items that this, if they did a spacewalk, they could grab those uh, items. And then all the fuel cells, the oxygen tanks, all of that auxiliary equipment that's required to uh, have life support and power in the spacecraft. And again, that's similar to what this area is, the service module, which powers uh, the command module. Now, by comparison, here's the single, per that, would, that would fit two people, the Gemini. By, by comparison, here's the single person Mercury spacecraft, which basically is like, you know, a tight suit. <laughs> okay, what made all of this possible? And I just wanna talk about this for a minute. When we entered the space race, when we mobilized an entire industrial and commercial complex of the United States from coast to coast in order with the single goal of putting humans in space, it really brought together this country and unified it in a tremendous way, at least in terms of this goal. And for that to happen, there has to be a, a swelling of public will. There has to be great leadership. That all has to combine to something that combines into passion and teamwork. So it's just not clock punching, okay? Now, this is highly technical stuff. So these people were highly educated. 
that means that they're they're driven people. They they don't want to just get a college degree, but they want to they want to do something with that college degree. They are learning that stuff because they want to accomplish something with it in their lifetimes. Okay, so this is the type of passionate people that and intelligent people that we had. Um, the other thing is that there was, like I said, there were no clock punching. All across the country, everybody was working overtime. It was like we have a deadline and we have a goal and we're, we all need to do our part to make it happen. And last but not least, we've talked about over and over and over again that breakthrough technology is highly required. Okay, so, um, so in the US, the public was required for Congress to act. That's the thing about the system that we live in. Okay, and that's driven first, actually, <laughs> the public's reaction was driven first and foremost by fear of the Soviets and the thought that they might have dominion over the planet by having the high ground in the new ocean of space, especially if they had an unchallenged capability of dropping these nukes for or from orbit because you cannot guard against that uh, even uh, with the technology of those days, there was just no prayer. So this is a second time of an attempt of these nations to have some, you know, form of geopolitical dominance, which is what we saw the outcomes of the sea race and, and the motivations for the sea race. Uh, in the Soviet Union, the public didn't really enter into that equation. You know, it was a very, very top uh, isolated, top-heavy regime, a totalitarian regime. And the, their ideas were that they wanted to basically have this geopolitical dominance, but they also uh, were after self-preservation because there was a lot of resistance against the Soviet bloc. Okay, so um, this is uh, slightly different than motives that we saw for the sea race, um, you know, during the Cold War, it really wasn't about God and gold. It was just basically about glory, okay? And in the end, though, uh, economies and economics are always behind the motives of, of human beings and their, and their uh, civilizations. But really preserving a way of life, uh, preserving what we would call freedom versus preserving, um, you know, a religion, uh, preserving language, it was really about preserving a way of life. Um, and therefore, the sort of God part fits into the equation a little bit as well. But in the end, this was about geopolitical dominance and spreading of your ideologies and preservation of your ideology. Now, one last thing I want to talk about is who were the brains behind all of this? And so I'm going to introduce you to the people who were in the uh, space task force and then were um, brought into NASA and drove Project Mercury. The first one is the leader of the space task force before NASA existed. This is Robert Gilruth. And if you ever watch some movies, and you were going to watch a few movies for this class, you'll, you'll see Robert Gilruth in a lot of these clips. Nobody knows who he is, but just watch for him. He's a pretty distinctive looking man. So I think you'll have no problem spotting him, okay? So he was an aerospace engineer. He was the first director of the Manned Space Flight Center, uh, which then later be called, became the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Center. That's the one that's in, in Houston, Texas. Now, another huge person is James Webb. And James Webb was the second administrator of NASA. He actually was not the administrator when NASA was formed, but quickly became the new administrator when we had a new president, John F. Kennedy. You know, remember Eisenhower formed NASA in 58, and then Kennedy became president. And he, um, uh, usually these large administrations, they, they, they replace the heads of them depending upon who's president. And so James Webb became the administrator of, of NASA, and he was the political beast, if you will. He is, kept the money flowing from Congress, and that was a lot of work, and he managed all of these different NASA centers and oversaw them all. And he, he did this all the way up until just before the first uh, manned Apollo flights. He is recognized as being a central key driver of uh, the success of NASA and the manned space programs. 
And maybe you are aware now that uh, the, um, uh, the new space telescope that's being designed is called the James Webb Space Telescope. And this is the man whom it's named after. Uh, the last two here are uh, Max Faget. And uh, Max Faget is the um, person who designed uh, the spacecraft. He was like the head engineer. He was also a member of the Space Task Force, but he's the one who figured out the blunt capsule end for reentry. And that became um, the mode for all future um, space flight that involved uh, small capsules. Now, uh, you, you might notice that the Dragon space capsule from SpaceX has a blunt end for reentry like that. The Soviets took a different approach. They designed a spherical um, capsule so that, that it could, they could not worry that the rotation of it was the right way when it entered, but in fact, the whole thing served as a, a heat shield um, and uh, it didn't matter what the orientation or the spin was of it. Okay, so they, they, uh, they simplified the engineering, but they also made it so that uh, enduring one of those missions uh, could be, well, you just might end up throwing up and getting sick and uh, it might not be very pleasant. Um, so he was a really big player. And then um, after that is Chris Kraft. And Chris Kraft joined um, NASA before Mercury, and he is basically the gentleman that wrote the book of spaceflight. So everything you see about spaceflight today, you know, uh, where there's a command control center on the ground, which became known as Houston, and these rows of, of people on computers, some up in the front, some in the back, and, and then a flight director who stood in the back and communicated with each of those. And the fact that there was a, um, a, a single person who communicated with the astronauts, which was not the flight director. And then the fact that each of these individuals that were in the command center had their own loop, uh, communication loop with a room of people outside, somewhere else in the building, uh, outside the main control room, that that was their team to talk about uh, of experts who knew everything about the systems that they were in charge of. This whole culture was invented by Chris Kraft. And so literally, I, I like to say that he's the inventor of you know, how you do space flight. And then last but not least, almost, is the breakthrough technology. And you all have lived in the day of miniaturization. And we're even getting better at miniaturization today. But miniaturization became possible by the invention of something called a transistor. And this actually was invented in 1947 and then perfected for another decade to the point where it was small enough now that you could, you could use these circuits uh, in spacecraft. They were light, they were reliable, and um, they did not generate a lot of heat. Before that, people used something called the vacuum tube. That, here's a picture of a vacuum tube. And it's a lot bigger than the transistor. I, I should have put these two to scale. This is a little bit more accurate. So that this transistor is something more about this size. And you can see you can save a lot of volume. And these actually generate a great deal of heat. And they also actually um, break down a lot. So uh, they also take time to warm up. So, you know, you turn on the circuit with a transistor, it's instantly ready to go and it's not heating your, your circuit board or your, or your spacecraft. And this was really what made uh, miniaturization uh, possible. Now today, uh, we live in a world where you have chips that have millions of these transistors all hardwired into the circuitry of the, of the chips themselves. So we've really taken, um, the transistor to the nth degree. And then I just like to end on this beautiful little image, beautiful moments in history. You know, we look back at these pictures today and it's hard to imagine putting ourselves in there and thinking of what it was like to live in those days because you didn't have the internet, you didn't have GPS. When the spacecraft flew, it didn't have communication across the entire orbit, okay? It had little stations that were on different continents that it could have 10 minutes of radio contact with, and then they were out of radio 
contact. This is the first time that they're building spacecraft, the first time they're flying them. You're building these, these bunkers and you're building these um, towers and putting all of this together and creating it for the first time. And I just think it must have been an amazing period of time to live, almost like what you know the people working with SpaceX must feel like today. And uh, here's an example that I love to show where you have a fueled spacecraft and you just have engineers buzzing around it like no problem. I mean, the risk for that is so tremendous. <laughs> we, you would never see that today. And uh, this, this is what I would call the wild west days of rocketry, if you will. Uh, even, uh, even though it's, a, it's highly sophisticated compared to the Pina Mundi, Werner von Braun, you know, wild west days, that still is the wild west of rocketry. One of the things that you don't capture in these photographs is the sense of the cutting edge experience of humanity after, you know, watching uh, looking back at the history of the sea voyages and the cutting edge of, say, the NAR for the Vikings or for the, um, the gosh, I'm having a, um, a mind fart on the name of the ship that the uh, Portuguese use. Um, anyway, it won't come to me. Caravel. So the Caravel, for example, was a breakthrough technology. And and then using it and, and the bravery of exploring the oceans. And now you've got this optimism uh, for the cutting edge of human experience again in the 60s. It was a magical period of time for these people. Uh, taking physics and engineering, which was at a level that had never been achieved you know, uh, until Isaac Newton came along and then was slowly developed over the next centuries, uh, all put together to make this happen. So that's our Mercury project. And um, what I'm gonna do now is uh, move in our next uh, lecture, uh, move over to Project Mercury. And um, we'll, I'm sorry, move over to Project Gemini. And what we're going to do then is talk about um, not just orbiting a spacecraft and circling around the earth, but we're gonna talk about a great deal of uh, innovation and actually flying the spacecraft. Gemini is where all of the firsts happened for space flight. It is a beautiful, amazing program. So we'll talk about that when we return.